The Lord be with you. Thank you, choir, for that. Just, just hearing that song and knowing how well you did it, I also know it, I mean, to, to me and dummy, it sounded like a hard one to sing, and you all did such a good job, so thank you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, we'll be reading there this morning. Acts chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for a letter to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Now, Lord, we... Pause to listen to a word from Scripture. Your words, as they speak to us, as they call us, as they challenge us. Or help us to lay aside whatever hindrance may keep us from hearing your words. Help us, Lord, to hear them, to take them into ourselves and be changed. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. It was on the paved sidewalk between Burns and Brooks Hall at Samford when it hit me. It was my first semester on campus. I had transferred after three semesters at a community college. And to that day, I had made a point to attend every convocation service. That was their chapel service every Tuesday and Thursday morning around 10, I think it was. To be honest with you, I don't remember any of those first chapel services. I don't remember who spoke at them. Probably Jim Barnett, who was the university minister at the time, now on the religion faculty. I don't remember what sort of music there was. Probably the student ministries choir, the a cappella choir, something like that. But I remember that particular day because I chose for the first time to skip the service, to sit in my own private protest on a bench within a stone's throw from the doors of Reed Chapel. You see, that, in that morning's service, they were going to have a guest preacher who was a woman. And I sat on that bench, gazing up at that spire of that chapel, with the intention to pray for all of those souls who would gather under its roof and in its pews that morning. I was going to pray that they wouldn't be led astray by this false teacher. I was going to pray for her own repentance, that she would come to believe as I and all good Bible-believing Christians at the time, I thought, did, that women were supposed to be what? Saul. Y'all know that a little too well. If your husband said it, you just go ahead and... Yeah. Women are supposed to be silent in church and the pulpit is only reserved for men. And men is in the right path who don't have hair on their ears. Right? See, I arrived on campus at Sanford with all that I own stuffed in the trunk in the back seat of a rebuilt 91 Toyota Tercel. And while I didn't own much, I did have a well-worn black bonded leather King James Bible that I was given on the occasion of my high school graduation. 
just about two years before. And I had read that Bible over at least twice by then. And I had read it the same way so many of my fundamentalist folks in my home Southern Baptist Church had. The prohibition of women preachers was hammered more than once on the pulpit by my pastor. But I want you to hear me say this. It was not in any mean-spirited or ill-willed way, but from a place of his deep conviction and his fundamentalist understanding of the Bible. So it was my understanding of the Bible. And when I heard that a woman would be preaching from the pulpit of the chapel on campus, I knew I had to sit it out. And the best thing I could do was pray. Pray for those who would have to listen. So I sat on that bench and I prayed that God would open their eyes, that God would show them what was wrong, that what was happening wasn't right. I prayed God would change their minds. And do you know what happened? Do you know what happened? As I sat there and prayed, I heard something, felt something stir within me. It was simple, really. So simple, in fact, I remember feeling a bit ashamed when I picked up my bag and walked on down the sidewalk and through the front doors of Reed Chapel to sit in the pew. I'd asked God to open their eyes, and God had opened mine. I'd asked God to show them what was wrong, and God showed me that I was wrong. I asked God to show them that what was happening wasn't right. And do you know what happened? He showed me that what was happening in that pulpit, in that chapel, was that someone whom God had called answered that call. Just the same way that I was. And that person who just happened to be a woman, a woman who is now one of my dear friends, was about to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And who was I to say that God couldn't speak through her? Especially if God was going to ever speak through me. In my pious pride, God disrupted what I was sure was right, and God called me further down this long road of change, down this long road of faith. And I'm sure it's the same sort of road that runs along the way between Jerusalem and Damascus. We know this road well, don't we? Those of us who've hung around the church long enough to hear about how old Saul became Paul, the great apostle to the Gentiles. Did you know there are at least three versions of this story? Three of them in the New Testament. We heard one earlier from from Acts 26. Paul tells another one himself in Acts 22. And then we have this one in front of us from Acts chapter 9, told in the third person, probably from Luke, who, guess where he heard it from? Probably Paul. And over the years of hearing this story, our collective imaginations have added a few embellishments, like the never mentioned horse that Paul falls from. If we tell that story without reading scripture, there's always a horse, but there's no horse. We've also added, I think, a bit of wickedness to Saul, believing him to be some sort of vile and evil enemy of God, bent on destroying the movement started by Jesus. And in part, we're not totally wrong. After all, Luke does say Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, got a letter to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, what the Christians were called before they were Christians, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So there's a little vehemence in Paul. But before we're too quick to condemn the old Saul as an evil agent of the devil himself, I think it's important to understand where he's coming from. After all, we call this the Damascus Road experience, don't we? But just as sure as this road is going to Damascus, it's coming from Jerusalem. And what's in Jerusalem? The high priest, the temple, the judgment seat of God. It is the very center of faith and devotion to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jerusalem is the geographic embodiment of the ancient Hebrew faith. 
That's the focal point of the faithful. It's from where Saul comes because he is a deeply, deeply devout Jew. One who has given his life not only to the studies of the scriptures, but as a Pharisee to the studies of the ancient rabbinical tradition surrounding the scriptures. He is committed to the pure, undefiled religion. Saul is not some dark cloak enemy standing in some dark shadowy corner, corner in a Marvel movie seeking to destroy the first Christians, the followers of the way, just because he's evil, just because he has some lust for power. No, Saul sees them as the unfaithful, as those who are dangerous, corrosive to the pure religion of Judaism. I do not doubt for a second that Saul prayed for them, that Saul prayed about them, that Saul studied the Scriptures and sought direction concerning these Jesus followers. And in that devotion, in that prayer, in that study, Saul reached the conclusion that was later affirmed by the high priest himself that these followers of Jesus were dangerous, that they should be punished, that they should be bound, stoned to death, stopped at all cost. Saul may have been breathing threats and murder against these early disciples, but for him, these threats came from a place of devotion, a place upheld and affirmed by the religion of his day. The religion grounded, they believed, in the Scriptures, and in the ancient traditions. Saul left Jerusalem on what seemed to him to be a mission from God. But something disrupted that mission. Something, better someone, called him. And nothing was the same. Luke says as he was going along and approaching Dam Damascus, Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He doesn't say, who is that? He says, who are you, Lord? Recognizing that whatever this is, is greater than he. And the reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Leave it to Jesus to disrupt a crusade. I've often wondered what must have been going on in Saul's mind at the time. Probably goes on in all of our minds when something seemingly supernatural happens, right? Is this real? Is this really happening? Or is this the devil trying to trick me? But, 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 but everything I've heard about this Jesus is that he was wrong. A blasphemer, a false teacher, bad for our faith. What does this mean, Saul must have thought, for my convictions now? Maybe he didn't have enough time to think. Like his whole religious house was on fire, and he didn't have time to grab every little conviction, and so he just ran out with nothing but his zeal and devotion to God. He is absolutely robbed. And it's not just his mission to Damascus that's disrupted, not just his crusade against the followers of the way, it's his whole life. And it starts with Jesus knocking him blind so that he might come to see. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up. And enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. And we're told Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing, nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, where for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now three days without sight, I, I get that, but, but why nothing to eat or drink? Maybe, maybe Saul was physically sick. Maybe his encounter with Jesus was so disruptive, so jarring, that Saul couldn't bring himself to eat or drink, as if sustenance was now secondary to discerning what all this means, what to do now, what to do with everything you've ever heard, everything you've ever been told, everything you've ever believed. What do you do with all this now? It really is nothing but disruptive. This call... 
this call to change. I mean, that's what it is, right? A call to change. Saul was once a threat and murder-breathing Christ-hater, and now, now he's been confronted by the very Jesus whose followers he seeks to silence. Saul, we know, eventually just drops the S and adds a P, becomes Paul, just, just sort of Greeks his name up a little bit. But he becomes easily the most important follower of Jesus in history. Saul becomes Paul. It's a change. This Damascus Road experience, as we call it, becomes the example of Christian conversion, a word that literally means change. But not everyone has one, right? Not everyone has a, a, has a pile, a, a past life of squalor and addiction. Not everyone has baggage weighed down with guilt and shame. Not everybody has skeletons clattering in their closet of past violence, hatred, and betrayal. No, why? why? If you were to ask some folks, they've been pretty good. Born pretty good. Family raised them in church. Been good their whole lives. Keep on living just pretty good, right? Nothing wrong with that. I've always thought these are the sort of folks who sometimes like to manufacture some great sin in their lives so they can have a Damascus Road experience. Like the little kid who stood up in Sunday school one time, wanted to give a testimony and said that, that he had lived a life of sin because he had skipped Sunday school one time because he wanted to stay at home and watch cartoons. But here's the thing. We hold up Saul's Damascus Road experience as the example of Christian conversion. Of changing from one wretched, vile sinner to saint on fire for God. But for Saul, for Paul, it was something else. It was a disruptive call that forced him to change from what he had always known, what he had always believed to be righteous and holy, what he had understood from the ancient scriptures and the ancient traditions of his faith to what he had believed was really, in fact, just the opposite. Saul doesn't go from being some washed-out heroin addict to a Harvard-educated preacher. This is not a spiritual rags to riches story. Saul is confronted by Jesus. Confronted with the deeper, wider truth of who it is, what God is in Christ. And it strikes him blind. Robs him of his appetite. Because this call to change is disruptive. Because it, as Paul Tillich once said, shakes the foundations of everything our lives are built on. Yes, the gospel calls the prisoner out of prison and into the pulpit. We know that. Our friend Vic Jacobson is a testimony to that. Yes, the gospel calls a murderer from his murdering ways into the life-giving light of God. Yes, the gospel calls a sinner out of a life of addiction and drug use and into a life of clean living and holy, holy devotion. Yes, the gospel calls sinners to be saints. But the gospel also calls those who think they've got it all figured out to realize that God is always just beyond the horizon of our certainty. And that ever-widening, ever-deepening reality that is God Calls us to change. Or maybe better yet, because we don't like that word so much. God calls us to grow. To realize like Saul, that God in Christ is bigger than our certainties and traditions. That God is calling us always on. Never wanting us to be settled for right where we are. For what we believe to be all there is. For what we think we have all figured out. A call to change is a call to grow. My lifelong mentor, Dr. John Granger, my dad's best friend, or my best friend's dad, you get it right. When I first felt this call into ministry, when I first became a Christian, I asked him, I said, Dr. Granger, I, I, tell me, how do I know, how do I know if I'm going the wrong way? He said, well, you'll know 
But I've always found that once you get real comfortable, once you get real settled and satisfied, you probably aren't moving along with God anymore. I don't know why that's always stuck with me. The call to change is a call to grow. And friends, growing is hard. I've seen that recently in my own boys. Uh, every morning, Sally gets Cole ready, and they leave and go to school, and I have to get Carter ready. And the other morning, I, I put a shirt on Carter, and I looked at it and said, Huh, I remember when we bought this shirt, and it was too big for Cole. And Carter's got one good le wear left in it. That's hard. That passing and changing, that growing, because you want them to stay right where they are. It's hard to grow on yourself. This morning, I meant to get a haircut yesterday, and when I, when I brushed my hair, I looked. Y'all, it's spreading. The gray is spreading. It's in here. It's in my beard. You know what? I think, I think I'm fatter, too. Don't, don't correct me. It's the wrong kind of growth. It's hard. I look at old pictures sometimes. We have a picture in our hallway from our honeymoon, and Carter asked last night, who's that? <laughs> Sally said, just two little babies. It's uncomfortable. It's painful, because you want to stay right where you are, don't you? Right where you've got it all figured out, right where everything makes sense, right where you know what's right from what's wrong, and you can tell everybody else. You want to stay right there. And most of the time... Growing and changing, that's just not something I want to do. Do you know why? Because if you ask me, some of the time, most of the time, I'm pretty sure I've got it all figured out. I'm pretty sure I've been around the block enough times, I've read enough, I've heard enough, been affirmed enough that I don't need to know or grow anymore. I'd like to think I'm in about the same place as Saul when he left Jerusalem full to the back teeth with conviction, backed up by the Bible, and affirmed by the powers that be, at least the powerful and well-known ones. But here again, Saul would come to understand that even with all that he was, all that he had, all that he knew, there was still more. Still farther to go. He would eventually write to his beloved Philippians, I too have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Nobody's above my pay grade, Paul says. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Can I contextualize this a bit for you? Essentially, Paul says, if anyone has bragging rights when it comes to being a godly person, it's me. Dedicated as a child in the church, born to a family of deacons and preachers, baptized after my first vacation Bible school, perfect attendance in Sunday school, chair of the deacons, head of the class in seminary, a teetotaler, and prayed up with every verse of the Bible committed to memory. Nobody's holier than Paul. Paul was bold enough to even say under the law, I am not just good, blameless. Is there any room left at the top over this man? Is there any room left above somebody like that? Can they be any better, have it any more together than that? Well, yeah. Because the call of the gospel it's not a call to stay put. It's the call to change, to grow, to constantly have our complacencies disrupted. Yeah, Paul says, if anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Tells us way more than we want to know about being circumcised on the eighth day. Way more than we want to know about his family heritage. Calls himself blameless under the law. But do you know what he writes right after that? Do you know what this blameless Sunday school superstar, literally this holier-than-thou man, wrote after listing all the ways he has his religious life together? 
Whatever gains I have, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard some things, most things, no. Everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Do you hear what he says? No matter how together he thought he was, no matter how sure he was of himself, his faith, his life, his knowledge, no matter what he had to back it, the affirmations of priests, the proof text of Scripture, the certainties of tradition, the pedigree that reaches back through the ages, Paul counts it all as garbage in the light of Christ's disruptive presence. Paul counted it all as nothing. Willing to lose it all. All that he had given his entire life for. For the sake of just knowing Jesus a little bit more. A little bit more. I wonder. What are you willing to give up? In order to know Jesus just a little bit more. What are you willing to count as garbage. In your own life. So that you may answer Jesus' call to grow. To change. Are you willing to give up more than just the usual stuff? Distractions, wastes, bad habits. Are you willing even to count it all? All that you believe to be certain to follow his call. To walk closer with Jesus. The call to change may be the hardest call to heed. It may be the most disruptive call on our lives as it will inevitably cause us to question even that which we've held on to for so long. That which has kept us so comfortable for so long. The gospel of Christ. The good news that God would intervene in history, take on flesh and die for the sake of love, forgiveness and redemption is a gospel call that calls us ever on despite the disruption it may cause. Because the truth is, everything, every single thing we hold on to, everything we think we've got figured out, everything that we think keeps us from the love of God, everything we think that weighs us down or keeps us tied up, it is all garbage compared to just wanting to know Jesus. So what is it? What is it that keeps you from answering his call today? I'm not just talking to the folks here who said, well, I've never, I, you know, I don't really know. I'm talking to every one of us. It's not just a call that comes to the unconverted. It is a call that comes to all of us. What is it that keeps you from answering the call of Christ today? Whatever it is. Don't think it keeps you from him. It's no better than trash. Give it up. Throw it away. And answer the call of Christ. The Christ that calls us ever on. The Christ that calls us to grow. The Christ that calls us to change. To become more and more and more like him. It is the call that comes even now to bring us to the table. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, Help us, Lord, not to be complacent in where we are. But to know, Lord, that your call comes for each and every one of us. No matter how long we've traveled this road, the call still comes. Always calling. For you are that call, Lord. Always calling us. 
come closer, closer, further on. And Lord, now as we gather around this table, on this World Communion Sunday, Lord, we know that we gather around it with sisters and brothers across the world and through the ages. Lord, it speaks to us the truth of the gospel, of your broken body and your shed blood for us. So as we come, Lord, to the table now, help us to heed your call. Lord, as we come, help us to set aside whatever it is that keeps us from taking this bread and this cup in a worthy manner. Help us to confess it to you so that when we take from this table, we take, Lord, in a way that is pleasing to you. So, Lord, be with us now as we gather around this table set before us to hear again the testimony of the good news of your love for us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.